is always on Dropbox because that's the only place where you get these videos and such like to play from. Once you upload it to Google Drive, never plays. That's why I use Dropbox. Those of you who are sort of sitting at the back, you know, if you must sit on the ground, please come to the front so at least you get to see some of, see something besides people's backs, right? Yes, I think that should do, okay. Now, we're gonna start, like in all my classes, we're gonna start with a little, interesting little activity. Each of you is gonna get a sheet of paper, a sheet of paper, please pass this around. It's blank. And here's what you're going to do. I'm going to show this in advance so you know we save some time and I can keep talking while you're doing this. You're going to first fold your piece of paper. This is how you know it's all about deep neural networks. It's very important. You first fold your paper into two perfectly like so, right? And then each half is going to be folded exactly the same way into two. So now it's folded into four, but inwards. And I think you already know what I'm trying to tell you to do, right? So that's like so. And then on one side, you're going to take one of these pens and write your name out big. That is me. This sheet of paper will this sheet of paper will come with you to every class. Okay? And why? Because then this opens out beautifully like this. And you can stick it in front of you and I will know who you are. And this is very important because I need to be able to address you by name as opposed to hey you in the blue shirt you with the you know yellow checks and the gray. Right? So this is standard. I do this in all of my classes. So please write your name down. Use one of these pens. We have five excellent pens over here. They write nice and thick. Don't use one of your flimsy little ballpoint pens because they won't write very big. And uh, yeah, if you need, just pass this. Someone open this and pass the pen around. And when you're done, please get the pens back. Okay, are we on? Check the video. Yes, the pens are going around. Here's one. And you guys on the ground, you probably should have your names on. If, you, if, there are, if we run out of paper, well, you're going to remain anonymous. But thank you, very kind of you. And if, yes, please, can you pass the paper out? The next class is not going to be quite so cramped. Uh, we, I mean, on Friday we are in Posner. The, the room is still kind of small. Baseball. <laughs> uh, but uh, from the next week we are in, uh, we're moving to uh, Gates 4307, which holds 70 people. So we should be more comfortable, right? Thank you. And just in case you don't know who I am, you should be able to read this. So, are we up, Ryan? Check this. Ah, oh, yeah, perfect. Lovely. Okay. So, when we get to this one, you're going to have to play the video for me, right? Okay, let's go to the first slide. All right. Morning, everybody. And welcome. Hi. Are you, you, I, thank you. Your name can be read both upside down and downside up, except it's kind of wrong. Okay. Uh, so, uh, welcome to the. Oh, wait. What am I welcoming you to? Okay. <laughs> Uh, 
welcome to something. Ah. Please bear with us while we get this sorted out. So this is pretty standard for the first class. We get ourselves, uh, can I try the clicker? Nope. Wait, do I have to turn the clicker on? Yeah, it is on. Oh, maybe you can just move the slides ahead. Okay, so okay, morning everybody, and welcome again to uh, the introduction to deep neural networks. The slide just says neural networks because this business of deep neural networks is a bit hokey, you know. Uh, it makes it sound more important than it is, like my two microphones over here. And, but it is an introductory lecture. So, Ryan, next slide. Now, by now, the reason you guys are all here is because you know these deep neural networks is the uh, is the latest what do we say big thing in AI. Uh, neural networks. I'm not, I'm not going to keep repeating the word deep neural networks in general uh, have become one of the major thrust areas in various uh, pattern recognition, prediction, and analysis problems lately. And in many problems, they've actually established the state of the art. So, for example, if you go to the next slide. Speech recognition, right? Until a few years ago, the idea that a computer could recognize speech as well as a human being can was considered kind of implausible. We've been working on this problem for over 50 years, and in spite of various claims uh, about the state of the, about the performance of systems, we never really got anywhere close to human performance. And this was from 2016 when we finally had an announcement from Microsoft that their system had be beaten human performance in one standard task. Afterwards, of course, I'll stay here so the camera sees me, right? Uh, afterwards, of course, uh, systems have improved further. We've beaten human performance on a, on a variety of tasks. Things have gotten better and better. Same thing with uh, translation. If you were using Google Translate prior to November 2015, you would have probably found that it wasn't very good. So if you started with English, translated it to say Spanish, then took that Spanish, stuck it back into Google Translate and translated it back to English, what went in and what came out would often have no relation to one another. I mean, this was a running joke. You would use Google Translate to translate various things and send the funny stuff that came out around. And then in November 2015, something magical happened. People just went to their computer, began using it, and the stuff worked. What had happened was to overnight, Google switched over to their neural network-based machine translation systems. And as it turns out, uh, neural network-based machine translation systems, the best system out on the web today are indistinguishables, distinguishable from humans performing the translation. They are really, really good. Same thing with uh, uh, image segmentation. Now this one, this picture I picked up from the web, so it must be true, right? Anything that comes you find on the web is true. Now this is supposedly an example of, uh, of a neural network based system segmenting and classifying objects in a very complicated scene. And what you find, does this have a laser point? Yeah, so what you find is this is a very complex scene. Probably in Germany, given the uh, uh, little <laughs> cathedral out here. And uh, the system has actually managed to identify segment, segment out. This is a cool, a cool bit, right? Uh, pretty much all of the interesting objects in the image. So here's this guy's bag, and here's the guy. Here's a guy. Here's a push cart. Uh, here's a human. This is a building of some kind. It's found it. It's, this is something else. It's found it. And not only has it segmented out every interesting object in the image, it's even assigned names to them. Now this, if you, I don't, I don't, 
know if you quite realize the complexity of this task and how magical this is. And it's so magical that I can't even believe that this is true. Maybe this is just some propaganda uh, slide, picture that someone put up on YouTube or on Google for people like me to get fooled by and pull it down. But the fact that I think it's plausible tells you something, that deep neural networks these days are capable of uh, performance like this one. Uh, can you play the video? So this one is from sitesound.com, and you can see what they're doing. This is live, supposedly, and they are tracking uh, a highway. They're segmenting out the cars on the, in the video and assigning and identifying the cars. And they aren't missing very many, right? Imagine how phenomenal this is. And this is being done by a deep neural network-based system. Same thing with games. For a very long time, I mean, people kind of assume that uh, pattern recognition systems can do all kinds of fancy stuff. But that did never really, if you're standing outside, please come on in. Uh, and you can sit in the front. It's better that you sit here. Right. Yeah. So uh, it was assumed that intelligence is this magical hidden thing inside human beings and that uh, machines can't really be intelligent. And till the early, late 80s, early 90s, it was assumed that you know, the, the people thought that chess was the limit. Chess really requires human intelligence. And uh, machine systems didn't really beat uh, humans at chess. Do you know where the first computer game that beat a human grandmaster was built? IBM. IBM, are you sure? You're sitting in the room where it was built, right? Uh, this was uh, uh, at, uh, this was Thomas Anantraman. It was his PhD thesis. And, and he didn't even start this as a thesis on uh, you know, playing chess. He, I think if I, if I recall correctly, he was trying to design processors for dynamic programming. And he just said, hey, let me try this on, a, on something really difficult and tried this on chess. Next thing you know, he uh, beat a human grandmaster, then went over to IBM and then beat Gary Kasparov. And there was a, there was a scandal about it. The very first game that uh, Kasparov played with the system, this was Deep Blue. There was a bug in the system, so it played wrongly and it lost. And then subsequently, they went and fixed the bug and it thumped Kasparov for the next five games. And Kasparov came back and said, you know, they did this on purpose. They made me get, put, get my guard down by having the system beat me, you know, lose to me in the first game. And that's why it beat me. Well, well that wasn't true. Afterwards, he, of course, never beat, beat any game, any uh, real computer game. And I think these days, he probably can't beat his uh, iPhone, right? But again, uh, but that wasn't using deep neural networks. People were trying to play chess with deep neural network based systems, and uh, uh, one of the uh, big names on trying to get this done was our own Dean, Andrew Moore, back in the day. But uh, then the next challenge came up, which was Go. And Go was, uh, now in a chess game, there are 10 raised, about 10 raised to 120 possible game states, which means that the state space is so huge, you thought that a computer couldn't really beat it, couldn't really learn all about it. And then they showed that it can. So the, you went up to a game which was 10 raised to 40 times higher. Uh, the number of game states in Go is about 10 raised to 160. So clearly, you know, a computer is never going to beat humans, right? Well, as of a few years ago, not only are computers beating humans. Here's, wait, can I go to the previous slide? Uh, next one. Go back to the Go slide. Wait, you're going backwards. Uh, go back. Um, yeah, yeah, stay here. So this was alpha zero, and in 700 steps of learning, so it's basically beginning to learn from scratch. It doesn't even know the rules of the game. It learns about the rules of the game. It learns to beat uh, the current best system in chess, which is Stockfish, after about 300,000 steps. It learns to beat the current best care system in Shogi after about 200,000 steps. I don't know what Shogi is. I do know what Go is and learns to beat uh, the current best, best system in Go, which was also neural network based, except the latest system learns to do this from scratch in about 500,000 moves. And trust me, this is a game which has basically 500,000 moves in a game is really not a whole lot, right? And uh, uh, it's, uh, probably it's probably going to take the system a few hours. In a few hours, the system learns to be so good, it's going to beat every single human being on the planet at the game. Now, so all of these, uh, here's another really uh, fancy result with uh, 
neural networks. Now, this result is old. The latest result on this kind of stuff is much better. These are pictures, and this is a man in a black shirt playing a guitar. This caption wasn't written by a human being. That was produced by a computer. That was produced by, by a deep neural network. Uh, this is a construction worker in orange safety vest working on the road, which is exactly what he's doing, again, by computer, right? So now this is a really, really challenging thing. This is just assigning semantics to a picture. It's, a, it's an intensely human task. And this is, a, this is an artificial intelligence system being done, uh, performing this task. And it's generated by a deep neural network. And so many other problems. Art, astronomy, healthcare, predicting stock markets, pretty much every single uh, field where, which can take advantage of AI, the state of the art is being established by deep neural nets. So, and can you play this video? This I put up just for the heck of it, right? I, well, you know, this has got to be Indian, right? The rest of the world is building rockets that go to Mars. We learn to rub our stomachs and pat our heads. Very important. But they actually have championships for this. You know, learning to rub your stomach and pat your head, doing complicated stuff at the same time, and the world champions are all in Indian. You know, they're jobless people. But you can actually build a robot that does this, and it would probably be powered by a deep neural network. Anyway, let's move on. <laughs> so this is the most important part of it, right? This stuff, a few years ago, having familiarity with neural networks and how to work with them on your resume was a bonus. If you had this, you got a better job. These days, if you don't have this on your resume and you call yourself a computer science grad, you're going to be like this guy, right? You know, I work for food. You're going to be jobless. So it's not become you know, a, a plus point on your resume. Not having it is a negative. And so in this course, what we are really going to do is to learn all about deep neural networks. We're going to learn to, you know, each, in each of these tasks, there was a deep neural network model which performed all of these very fancy looking tasks. Hopefully by the end of this course, you know how they were built. Not only that, given the right resources, hopefully you will be able to build them yourself. Uh, the, uh, uh, this website, now if I were doing this on my laptop, I'd pull up the website, has, maintains a uh, list of all of the latest uh, architectures in uh, deep learning. And again, one of our objectives for this course is that by the end of the course, you would be familiar with all of these, or at least be able to comprehend what these architectures mean and design them yourself. What you won't, what won't happen is that you won't actually become a world-leading world expert in the area in just one course. This is a fast-developing field. There's a ton of stuff happening every day. If you're just following deep neural networks on archive, you're not going to be able to keep up with the literature that happens every single day. So on any given day, you're going to get dozens of new papers appearing, of which the majority are probably inconsequential, but there are going to be papers which really matter. And they're going to keep popping up every week, meaning if you want to be, in the, if you want to be thought of as one of the leading experts in the field, you're going to have to keep up with the literature. But what you will become is sufficiently expert to be called to that Somebody who is looking for a deep neural, for a computer computer scientist to help their company developing AI, develop AI tools using deep neural networks, they're going to hire you. Because if you're done with this course and if you go through all the homeworks and, and the project, you really will know your stuff, not just in theory, but also be able to do things with your hands. I'm the instructor, in case you don't know. And this, it must be evident, I'm up here talking, right? My name is Bhiksha, that's my uh, phone number. So X89826, X stands for 26. How many of you know that 268 stands for CMU on your phone? Come on, you're CMU kids, shame on you, right? Uh, we actually have our own area code, uh, which is, well, not, not area code, but the, ex the local exchange. The digits are CMU, so my phone number is 412-CMU-9826. Uh, we have a collection, we have a little zoo of uh, TAs, 15 of them. Two of them are sitting up front, trying to, actually one of them. Rajat there used to be a TA, he is, uh, is a volunteer today, but there's one at the back. Ahmad, do you mind standing up? 
and Ryan can't stand up because the laptop, because he's streaming and stuff will collapse. Something bad will happen, right? And there are a collection of others, a large number of others who are not here, who are supposed to be here. Uh, and uh, hopefully most of them will be here in the next class. Uh, that's good that they're not here because you wouldn't have been, you wouldn't have all found place to sit. Uh, they are, so we have, for the course is being broadcast to several campuses. To CMU has a campus in Kigali in Rwanda. And so the course is being broadcast there. We're being, it's being broadcast to the Silicon Valley campus. And these guys are the most unfortunate people on the planet. It's 6 a.m. over there right now. <laughs> and then it's also being broadcast to Doha. Right? So we have TAs on each of these campuses. If you, have any, if you need any help for anything, uh, people on each campus must approach their local TA first for, before beginning to uh, uh, request help of the TAs who are here in Pittsburgh. The majority of the TAs are in Pittsburgh. Uh, the TAs off hours and such like are going to be on the course pages. They're not yet up. The course web page itself is deeplearning.cs.cmu.edu. It's very easy to remember. CS, CMU, EDU, and deep learning. Deep learning is the subject. Now, uh, there is a lot of information on, on the logistics of the course. And I, instead of spending a great deal of time just rambling about the logistics, what I did was to record a separate lecture about the logistics about the homeworks, about the quizzes, how things are going to be scored, uh, pretty much any, everything that I would have talked about over here when, I, when I'm introducing the course to you, including the actual syllabus that I'm going to be co covering during the course. So uh, please, please see this video, but it's, this is not just a request. In order to motivate you to actually see the video, uh, we're going to have a quiz where, with several questions about logistics. And you won't be able to answer those questions if you don't watch the video. Right. But I will go over some of the logistics right here. We're going to have in class an online section. So this is the in class section. It's going to be streamed by, uh, by a media tech from the next class. Right now, this is the last class in which uh, the TAs will be streaming it. Uh, it will, the videos are also going to be up on YouTube. We have our own channel. Uh, people who cannot watch the video, cannot be in the class, are ex expected to follow the streaming video if you have course conflicts or if like the folks in the Silicon Valley campus, it's too early and you know, it, uh, it's not reasonable to be expecting you to sit, sit there brushing your teeth and watching the video, uh, then uh, you can see the video on the YouTube, web, uh, YouTube channel. But you are required to watch the videos. Why? Because that is the point of this class. If you think you're just going to go through the class and just solve the homeworks and you know get a grade, sure. But you pay for this course. And if you're not watching the videos, then basically you've given us 2,000 of your dollars for nothing. And uh, if you have any bit of you know conscience about where your money goes, you must be watching the videos. But then we also like to motivate you, right? So we have quizzes and recitations. First, we have 13 recitations in addition to the lectures, 26 lectures, which will cover implementation details, basic exercises. You had the very first recitation on how to use the Amazon uh, web services earlier the, uh, on Monday, right? So we have 12, uh, 12 more. The list of uh, recitations is on the website. Again, these two will be streamed. I strongly recommend that you also watch the recitations. And why you must watch the lectures? We have quizzes. We have uh, 14 quizzes in total during the course. And each quiz is going to comprise 10 multiple choice questions, except the first quiz where we have 15 questions because we also wanted to grill you on the logistics of the course. And the quizzes each week will relate to the topics covered that week. You will be given 24 hours to answer the quiz. The quiz must be answered online. And uh, of the 14, we will be choosing the best 12 for every student, which means if you fall sick, if something happens, you can afford to lose up to two, which means that if you find yourself in a situation where you cannot uh, you know, submit a, answer a particular quiz, don't approach me. You're allowed to fall sick no more than two times in the semester. After that, you lose a grade. Blame your bacteria. Don't lie, you know, don't come to me, right? Uh, now, so again, which means you can, 
in general, I suggest you actually go through all 14 to give yourself the best chance at uh, getting the best marks. The uh, slides that I'm showing in class are not complete. So if you're following the numbers on the slides, you'll occasionally see the slide number jump from 24 to 36. That means there were 12 hidden slides in between that I'm not showing in class, primarily because if I went through everything that was on the slides, I would not finish the class on time. Also, maybe those materials, are, I don't think of those materials as being, that material as being so critical as requiring presentation in class, but you are required to go over them, which means you download the slides from the website and go over them. And again, to motivate you, we are going to have questions and the quizzes, and the quizzes are going to kind of focus on the stuff I didn't present in class. Half the questions will be stuff from, that I didn't present in class, the other half will be stuff I did present in class, and, so, and very often, uh, the quizzes will have questions relating to stuff I do talk about in class but are, but are not on the slides. So this is to make sure that you also have to watch the slides. And this week we are planning on a really cunning quiz, quiz question, which is to say we are going to ask you the difference between the number of slides I'm actually showing in the class and the number of slides in the deck, which means you're going to have to go through both of those even if you're not actually here in class following the video. You're going to have to go through the video to find out how many slides are actually showed, and you can't skim through the video because then you're going to count things wrong, right? I'm very mean. So this is just to make sure that you follow stuff. Again, I'm being nice to your parents. Your parents are paying for this. Okay. The course is not easy. It's going to be a lot of hands-on stuff. You're going to be programming. The homeworks are killers, very tough. Just in case you didn't get it, it's a lot of work. If you still didn't get it, it's a lot of work. And if you still didn't get it, it's a lot of work, right? Not meant for chicken. Now, well, what does happen is that as the course progresses, people begin to chicken out. And it's a waste of your time. It's a waste of my time. And it's generally not, it's kind of pointless, right? Who wants to be chicken? So uh, again, I, I must thank uh, my students from the last edition of this course. We started off with 200 students and 175 stayed to the end. 178, but three of them switched to pass fail, right? So which means we had only about 10% of the students dropping out and some of them had valid reasons. This is a characteristic of CMU students. If I have an easy course with easy grades and easy quizzes, I usually find half the students dropping out. And then when I up the ante, the tougher I make it, they begin beating on the door and beating each other up to make it into the course because, hey, you're macho, right? You're a kid at CMU. You are that good. So and we, are, we are staying up to CMU standards in the, uh, with regards to the work we are giving you. I expect you to maintain CMU standards in the course. Stay with it and complete the work. Uh, but uh, if you actually go through the, uh, the, the logistics, it, I explain, we explain how we're going to grade you. Our focus is not on deadlines, except that we do need deadlines because without deadlines, things wouldn't end. You wouldn't get your grades at the end of the semester. So uh, we've sort of tried to design it so that we give you the maximum amount of time to do the work, sometimes way past what we nominally call the deadline. The idea is to have mastery-based evaluation. We are evaluating you. We would like to evaluate you on how well you've learned the, learned the subjects of the course, not on you know whether you actually managed to submit stuff in time for the deadlines and such like. Deadlines are primarily motivators to make sure the course ends on time, and that we get you that we are in a position to give you feedback about your progress during the course in the course on time. If I let you submit all of your homeworks and all of your assignments on the last day of the course, you won't know where you are, where you stand in the course till the very end. So that's the only reason we actually have uh, deadlines. But for the, 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 primary, the primary objective over here is to try to ensure that all of you gain some mastery on the subject. And anybody who gets an A in the course is, should technically be ready to go and do a deep learning job out in the industry. In fact, I would say that anybody who gets an A or a B should be good for the industry. And again, uh, the students who took this course, the, the, Pretty much all the students, masters and PhD students who took this course in the last edition went out to internships and a great many of them, I would guess at least three-fourths of them, uh, did internships on deep learning jobs. 
where having gone through this course had a very direct impact on their being able to do the internships. Right? So this is the last class in this room, which means if you would spent a lot of time and effort trying to come here, uh, please don't use, you know, use those brain cells for something else because the next class is going to be in POSNA 151. And from next week, classes will be in GHC 4307, which can hold up to 70 people. And MediaTek is actually going to uh, be in charge of streaming as well from next week. So, and MediaTek and Panopto are probably the best setup we can possibly have for streaming. So we're going to be good. I'm not going to pause for questions because we'll run out of time. If you have questions, post them on Piazza. Hopefully, everybody is on Piazza, right? Uh, if you're not on Piazza, send us a note. Immediately, you should get on, on Piazza. Uh, we have uh, tried to, uh, I'm keeping on top of the, uh, the enrollment, and we've tried to make sure that everybody who is enrolled is on Piazza and Autolab. We're also trying to make sure that everybody who's enrolled has access to their uh, AWS coupons. All students will get up to three AWS coupons. Uh, and uh, use them wisely because one of the big problems with using AWS is that some of you log in and forget to log out to turn off your instance. And then you come to me at the end of the semester saying, I have a $10,000 bill. What do I do? And I am not joking, right? Uh, two, three, four, ten. These are the kinds of numbers I've seen from students who were too careless, too lazy, uh, you know, got distracted. You don't want to find yourself in that situation. This course is not that important that you have to sell your house for the homework. <laughs> okay. Well, it is, but you'd rather not, right? right. So let, before I begin, this is completely unrelated to everything we are going to cover. But Frank Rosenblatt was uh, one of the big names who we'll encounter in a few minutes, and he had this very, you know. It, we are speaking of AI, and AI started with ideas of cognition and perception. And Rosenblatt was one of the first people who began to work on real, you know, what I what I would call modern computational models of these uh, phenomena. And here's a very nice long description of what perception is. Perception then emerges as that relatively primitive, partly autonomous, institutionalized, ratio-morphic subsystem of cognition which achieves prompt and richly detailed orientation habitually concerning the vitally relevant, mostly distal. It's one sentence, right? And so the New Yorkers simplified it. They said, that's a simplification. Perception is standing on the sidewalk watching the girls go by. This was in a time where it was allowed to say this and you wouldn't go to jail. If I said this, now I'd go to jail. Right? <laughs> now, let's move on, right? Questions? Yeah. You obviously got the lesson. You'll be posting them on Piazza. Let's continue. So, and now we begin with the actual material that we're going to cover. These are the tasks that we just spoke of, right? Uh, we said neural networks have achieved the state of the art in speech recognition. A voice signal goes in, a transcription comes out. An image goes in, a text caption comes out. A game state goes in, the next move comes out. But what happened between the input and the output was a box, a black box. What exactly is this black box? This is what we're really going to be focusing on. And what we see so is that all of these tasks are fundamentally human tasks, playing games. I mean, even if you ever do see a chimpanzee playing chess, it's probably because a human has spent a lifetime training it, and it's not really going to work. right? Uh, or all of the other tasks, recognizing speech. We are the only species who even speaks in the manner that, I mean, there are many other species who produce some kind of communication, vocal communication, but we have very detailed and efficient language. And recognizing speech is a very human task. Assigning captions to images, describing stuff in language is a very human task. So all of these actions, those black boxes that we just saw, are powered by the human brain. So if we really want to understand how these things can be done computationally, maybe we want to start by trying to understand the human brain, or even earlier, try to understand what it means to think. What is cognition? Uh, anybody know, familiar with the statue? It's very famous, right? So who hasn't seen a picture of this before? So you guys are not fond of raising hands, right? 
So nobody's seen a picture of this before. Or have you? Right. Guys, engage. If you sit here and sleep, and then I respond and sit here and sleep, we'll go through 26 lectures where this is just going to become a place to come and rest. Right? So unless you want me to call you out and say, you know, Jing, have you seen this picture before? <laughs> no. See? You don't want that to happen to you, right? So respond. Okay? Now, does anybody know who this one represents? This was Auguste Rodin's The Thinker. If you go to Paris, you can go to this uh, place uh, by the Saint where you can actually see this, this and several other of the statues. And this was supposed to be the next slide, Dante Alighieri. And who knows who Dante is? Oh, thank you. Some of you do, right? He's the guy who wrote. Say it aloud, please. The, yeah, the, the Divine Inferno, right? Anyway, so again, that was just an aside. The point was, it's the act of thinking, the act of cognition. What are all the things humans can do? We can think, right? I and mean, think about thinking. This is a phenomenal thing. We think pointlessly. You're having a shower. You're not just sitting there and having a shower. Your brain is running. You're thinking about something. Maybe you're thinking about your latest assignment. Or at least that has a point. Very often you're thinking about stuff that has no relevance to your immediate life. And that's where creativity comes in, right? Uh, we can, which means we can create. We can recognize patterns. We can solve problems. We can learn. All of these are fundamentally and deeply human actions, at least to the best of our knowledge. And these are the result of cognition. These are cognitive processes. So what exactly is this business of cognition? This is something that humans have been wondering about for hundreds, no, thousands of years. But then here's the problem. Uh, Marvin Minsky's quote, if the brain was simple enough to be understood, we would be too simple to understand it. It's beautiful, right? That, ha that hasn't stopped us. We keep trying. And so our attempts have gone back to about 400 BC, at least 400 BC. So what I mean by this is that there are recorded attempts at trying to describe the, 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 how the human brain walk, works going back to Plato in 400 BC. And Plato came up with this theory called associationism. Anybody recognize this picture up here? Thank you, right? <laughs> so and those guys in the middle, just to make it more complex for those. And there you go. Right, he knows. <laughs> and you are Ramesh. Thank you. So uh, now this business of associationism actually had quite a, quite a following, and people worked on it for hundreds of years. David Hume was a uh, thousands, two th over 2,400 years, 300 years. David Hume was from the 17th century, I believe, a, a British philosopher, or maybe 18th. And uh, who, doesn't, who hasn't heard of Ivan Pavlov? Right. You haven't heard of Ivan Pavlov? Yeah, so you must have all you recognize this famous experiment, or you should, right? Uh, he trained a dog by providing it food every time he, and ringing a bell every time he gave it food. And thereafter, every time he rang a bell, the dog would begin to sal salivate. So what has the dog formed? an association between the bell and food. So Ivan Pavlov was actually working on the theory of associationism. What exactly is associationism? Now here's an example, right? Lightning is really followed by thunder. So if you see a bolt of lightning, you're going to expect thunder. On the other hand, if you hear thunder, even if you haven't seen the lightning, you assume that lightning has struck someone somewhere or close by, right? So you formed an association between lightning and thunder. And these guys came up with uh, many rules of association, which you will see on the slides, and they're going to get questioned about, about how one might form associations. And it turns out this notion, that the whole idea that uh, they had was that uh, we sort of learn to think. Ev everything about how we actually learn to operate, how our brain works, has to do through these associations and inferences formed from these associations. So it's associations over associations over associations. And it turns out it's not really a bad idea. It actually kind of explains a lot of things that we see because, heck, if you look at machine learning, what are we doing? We're just learning very complex association models, right? Here's the input, here's the output. I'm going to learn something in between that's going to associate the two. 
So the notion of association is not really a bad idea. It's a really beautiful idea. But just saying that I associate A with B gives me no insight into the problem. What I really need to know is how I form the associations. And that is not explained by the mere idea of association. Trying to develop ideas on how associations may be formed or stored took a long time. And we began, try, we began sort of coming up with hypotheses around the mid-1800s when people realized, firstly, by, by this time people had already realized you know, for hundreds, maybe over a thousand years, that all of these things happen in the brain, not in your knee or your heart or somewhere else. But these things happen in your brain. And by the mid-1800s, at which point uh, we, ha we had very good microscopes, people actually realized that the brain is just a mass of interconnected neurons. And the way it is composed, you have thousands of, actually, we didn't know the number back then, but we know now that it's billions of neurons, tens of billions of neurons, uh, that where each neuron connects to many other neurons, and each neuron is connected to by many other neurons. Now, this by itself doesn't tell you anything. It's just a substratum. It tells, tell, tells you what the platform that actually performs cognition looks like. You still need a model for how the cognition is actually performed. And that, the first real modern theory for this came up in 1873. This guy over here, Alex Bain, he was a philosopher, a mathematician, a logician, a linguist, a professor. So back in those days, science hadn't progressed very far. So most people basically were experts in every field. He would have, I wouldn't have been surprised to know that he's also a doctor, a brick worker, you know, and an astronaut. I mean, that's, that's how people were. So, but then he came up with this really cool idea where he said that all of the information stored in the brain is actually stored in the connections. And he even came up with these really cool ideas first that depending on the connections decide how the thing operates. I can have, I can have a single network with a fixed set of connections and based on how the connections are formed, the network can produce different outputs for different inputs. So here, for example, if A, alpha, you know, a and B fire, X is going to fire. If A and C fire, Z is going to fire. If B and C fire, Y is going to fire. So it's the same network, but different combinations of inputs are going to produce different outputs. And even better, the level of the input can change the pattern of output. So here, for example, if the input is weak, only this guy will fire because it receives three copies of it. But if it's strong, even this guy will fire. So uh, this idea that you can have a fixed structure designed, defined by the connections, which is going to provide different kinds of outputs for different inputs, it seems obvious to us now. You know, that's how everything works. Back in the 1800s, this was anathema. He said this and people laughed at him. They said, no way. But uh, pain was, this is actually the first modern artificial neural network model, uh, you know, uh, uh, pr proposal for artificial neural networks. So, uh, you know, everything that we are doing today, it's not a modern invention. Artificial neural networks as we know it were proposed in some form way back in 1873. So this is going back, what, 145 years, right? Pretty amazing. Uh, Bain also actually suggested how this network could learn. So he actually covered the whole base, how it stores information and it, how it learns to store information. His whole idea was, how, was based on what we currently call Hebbian learning. I won't read this. Let's move on. Uh, the next slide. Why Things stalled after Bain, Bain for several decades for a very simple reason. Uh, now, here's a very nice quote by Bertrand Russell. The fundamental cause of the trouble is that in the modern world, the stupid are cocksure and the intelligent are full of doubt. The, the classic Kroger-Dunning effect, right? And uh, this was true of Bain as well. So he went through the math and he postulated that there must be one million neurons and five billion connections in order to obtain 200,000 acquisitions in the brain. Then he said, wait, 200,000 acquisitions is not going to explain everything that we do. The number of different inferences that we make is much, much larger than that. And then we also have lots of partial acquisitions stored in the head. So he worked out the arithmetic, and mind you, all this time people were scoffing at him. Nobody believed him. And eventually, by 1903, he said, nah, I was wrong. He apologized to the world and died. Now, uh, of course, we know that he was wrong, not up here, 
but wrong in this. Because today we know that the human brain is really amazingly large. It has over 80 billion neurons and over a trillion connections. There's ample capacity to perform pretty much everything that we perform these days. Obviously, we do, right? And the information indeed is in the connections. So, his theory of connectionism, where information, which says that the information lies in the connections, lives on. Neurons connect to other neurons, and the processing capacity of the brain is a function of the connections. So this is the connection, connectionist theory. And modern connectionist machines actually emulate the structure of the brain. So what is a connectionist machine? It's a network of processing elements of this kind. And all world knowledge that is stored in the machine is stored in the connections. Now, uh, the, this computer that Ryan's got, or each of your standard computers, or your smartphones, or whatever else, what kind of architecture do they have? Anybody? How would you define that architecture? By the way, those of you with open laptops, please shut them. This is a classroom where laptops must not be kept open. Right, do you mind? Uh, you are a TA. You're allowed, right? He has to follow the streaming. Uh, but uh, so how, how do you define the architecture of the uh, modern computer? You know, there's a name for it, right? It's, pardon me? It's a von Neumann architecture. What's, what is a von Neumann architecture? There's a processor, there's a memory, and there's an I.O. device, right? This is what the von Neumann or the Howard architecture looks like. You have the processor, and the memory is separate. And the memory stores the programs and the data. And this is what enables a single machine of that kind to perform millions of different uh, uh, actions. You just change the program, it does something else. You change the data, it does something else. So that makes it really, really versatile. On the other hand, uh, and which is why, you know, we even use it to emulate connectionist machines these days. On the other hand, a connectionist machine is very different. A connectionist machine, in a connectionist machine, the program is the architecture. The connections specify the program. If you want to change the program, you have to change the machine. You have to change it because you have to rewire your entire machine, which is why you don't actually go off and build a hardware for your neural network every time you do it. You actually emulate this guy on this guy, right? Simply because as a machine by itself, a connectionist machine is a fundamentally different principle than your standard machines. So go ahead, Ryan. So here's a quick recap of everything we've seen so far. Neural network-based AI has taken over most AI tasks. Now, uh, and of course, these things began originally as computational models of the brain, or more generally, models of cognition. The earliest model of, the, of cognition was associationism. The more recent one is connectionist, uh, which says neurons are, neurons are connected to neurons, and the workings of the, of the brain are encoded, encoded in the connections. Current neural network models are all connectionist machines. I'll pause for a couple of seconds. Any questions? No? OK. So here we are again. This is the connectionist machine. You have a bunch of units. They're connected to one another in different ways. And all information about how it operates is actually stored in the connections. But then the units are also important, right? What are these individual elements? Now. The individual elements, by the way, so there's some, uh, one of the earliest people to have proposed something similar to what we currently call connectionist machines, neural networks, was uh, with a complete mechanism for how to make these compute different kinds of functions and how to learn these functions was Alan Turing. So if you go through the slides, you will you'll see a couple of slides about it, and uh, you're going to have a quiz question about it. Alan Turing did everything. But anyway, moving on. So what are these units in the, in, the, in, in the brain? In the brain, if you go back, uh oh, next one. Yeah, we're moving in the wrong direction. Yeah, so next, next one, please. Yes, OK. Oh, really? OK, so in that case, oh, 
fantastic. My clicker is working. Uh, lovely. So I'm, I'm free of having to gesture to you. So here are the units in the brain. The individual units in the brain are neurons. And here's what a neuron looks like. Uh, it's got a, this main head with a, something called a soma, which is the nucleus. And all of these dendrites through which other neurons communicate to the neuron. Now, when the total signal from all of these dendri dendrites exceeds a threshold, then this neuron fires. That signal travels down this long leg and is communicated to other neurons. So this long one is called the axon. It's covered by <coughs> something called the myelin sheath, uh, which are formed by glial cells, and it's mostly fat. So this is something like I like, like to inform everybody. How intelligent you are is not decided so much by the number of neurons in your head as by the amount of fat in your head. So being called a fat head is like a great compliment, <laughs> right? Don't forget that. In fact, people have analyzed uh, Einstein's brain, you know, distorted his brain. And, you know, everybody's interested in how is Einstein's brain different from mine. It turns out he has more glial cells than normal people. He has much more fat in his head than you and I or had. So you really want to be a fat head. Also, uh, adult neurons don't undergo cell division. Now, this is another crazy bit of information. You don't get smarter as you grow older because you get more neurons. You get smarter as you grow older because your neurons die, right? And that should scare you. Anyway, so that's the biological neuron. But if you want to perform computations with it, you need a computational model for it. And the first computational model was formed by these two guys. One of them was uh, Warren Meckler, and the other is Walter Pitts. Uh, Warren Meckler was a professor in the University of Chicago. Walter Pitts was a hobo who ended up at his door. And who is who? Anybody want to guess? So this guy is Meckler. <laughs> and this is Walter Pitts. Walter Pitts was 15 years old or something. He ran away from home and never, ne never went back home. He used, to he used to exchange mail with Bertrand Russell. And one day at the ripe old age of 19, he ended up at uh, Warren Meckler's uh, door. Meckler took him in, and they worked on the perceptron. Right? So this was, called the, this was the first mathematical model of the neuron. It wasn't called a perceptron back then. It's described in this lovely paper by Meckler and Pitts. And Pitts was only 20 years old when he wrote the paper. Now, almost 80 years later, I still can't understand the paper. Very few people can, because he invented his own math to make the descriptions. And uh, it's kind of dense. But here's the basic idea of how, basic model of how they actually uh, computationally characterize each individual neuron. You have a unit which is going to fire if it actually gets two or more inputs. It can get inputs from, from many different connections. They can have two kinds of connections. They are the, uh, uh, they are, they are, can you go to the next slide? They are the excitatory synapses. These are the synapses which actually excite the neuron, and if you have sufficient excitation, it's going to fire. You also have the inhibitory synapses. If some signal comes down this guy, this guy is not going to fire regardless of what comes in from here. This is the Meckler and Pitts model. And they showed that, the, that this model, oh, yeah, I have the clicker, I forget, right? Uh, so uh, that this model can actually perform all kinds of Boolean operations. So here, for example, uh, every time one fires, a little later, two fires, because it's expecting two inputs. If one fires, two gets two inputs. So this is just a delay. Here, if either one or two fire, this is going to get two inputs. So this is an or. Here, both of these must fire, and only then will this fire. So this is an and. Here, if one fires, three will fire, but only if two is not active. So it's one and not two, right? So you can perform all kinds of Boolean operations, which means you can actually perform some fairly complicated uh, uh, Boolean arithmetic. You can perform pretty much any kind of Boolean arithmetic with, connection, with, with, with uh, networks of these basic, uh, basic units. Now, this was one of the landmark, uh, peer, la landmark uh, uh, proposals in the history of neural networks. But when Meckler and Pitts first made this proposal, they actually kind of went overboard. And they claim that their nets should be able to compute a small, you know, a, a pretty large class of functions. And they said they could be equivalent to Turing machines if they, if, uh, if they had a tape. 
And they even said they were Turing complete, but they just made these claims and never really actually proved anything and these claims are all wrong because it's a finite state machine and you can't be Turing complete if it's just finite state, right? Uh, but they also didn't act, provide a mechanism whereby the network could learn how to perform its operations. The first real proposal on how networks, the net, uh, network could learn came from Donald Hebb in this uh, uh, paper, in this book called Organization of Behavior, where he basically has said that if I have two neurons which are connected, every time the two fire together, the connection is going to get stronger. So uh, uh, you have, for example, this neuron connected to this guy through a, this dendrite, and now this is coming out from the axon of one neuron. Every time this guy fires and causes this to fire successfully, this little head, he said, is going to get bigger. So neurons that fire together, wire together. That was the, that was the famous statement that uh, uh, he made. And he actually came up with a math mathematical uh, model for this. So let's say W is the strength of the connection between these two guys. Then any time these two fire together, X and Y are both going to be one. And so this weight is going to increase a little because eta is always positive. Now, what is the problem with this kind of learning mechanism? Anyone? Yeah, there's no re reduction. If you wait long enough, every connection is going to be saturated. So this is really, this doesn't really explain the real world. It's, it's, it's fundamentally unstable and learning is unbounded. People came up with all kinds of corrections like uh, generalized Hebbian learning, also called Sanger's rule, where uh, Sanger came up with the idea that you can try to modify Hebbian learning to explain multiple outputs at, e at, at, at the same time. Uh, there were other corrections. Hebbian learning is used all over the place, but then you have to make this fundamental modification that you're also allowed to decrease weights as opposed to increase weights, which leads us to this guy, Frank Rosenblatt. Frank Rosenblatt was the fellow who basically killed research on neural networks for about 10 years by, by basically building the first model of the mod modern perceptron. Now, you are likely to ask me, why is it that building a model of the perceptron is going to kill research in the area? And here's why. So he came up with this, his model was this one, which we are all very familiar with now. The idea was that if you have a bunch of inputs into a unit, the way the unit operates, it looks at a weighted combination of all of the inputs. If the weighted combination exceeds a threshold, it's going to fire, otherwise it does not. So you have a number of inputs which combine linearly and the unit fires if the combination exceeds a threshold and otherwise it, otherwise it doesn't. And as he showed, this is actually, this very simple structure is extremely versatile. It can perform all kinds of operations. In fact, this little unit, if you wanted to replace this little unit by a Boolean, Boolean function, or a network of standard binary Boolean elements, or even MRE Boolean elements, that network would have to be exponentially large in the number of inputs, something that could be done by this, just this one unit, and we'll see why in the next class. So he was hyper excited, but even more excited than he were all the newspapers of the time, which said things like the embryo of an electronic computer that the Navy expects will be able to walk, talk, see, write, reproduce itself and be conscious of its existence. New York Times, 1958, right? Frankenstein monster designed by the Navy that thinks. Night Tools, the uh, Tools of Oklahoma Times, 1958. Now obviously they're going overboard because this was the machine. Nothing more than this, this was the machine that was going to walk, talk, and reproduce itself. <laughs> and uh, Rosenblatt also provided a learning algorithm for this. We're gonna see this again in a couple of classes where the connection between an input and, uh, and an output would have some weight. And the learning process was that if the, our current output of the uh, unit did not match the desired output of the unit, then the difference between the two multiplied by the, by the current input was added to the current weight. And this learning rule is very popular. We use this all over the place, everywhere in machine learning. The first person to define it actually one of the first people was uh, Frank Rosenblatt. And he proved that using this learning algorithm, his little unit could learn, you know, there was a convergent rule which that allowed his, this little perceptron to learn all kinds of things. The problem, of course, is that it's not 
a machine that's ever going to walk, talk, and learn to reproduce itself. And here, here are the things it can do. A perceptron can be a Boolean uh, function. Here are now in these figures, uh, remember you're looking at a weighted combination of inputs and comparing it to a threshold. So in these figures, I have inputs. Each of these is a perceptron. The weights are written about the arrows. and The threshold is inside the circle. So look, this figure here is, has a threshold of two. It's the only way this fires is if both X and Y are active. This one has a threshold of one. It will fire if either X or Y are active. Because if either of them is active, then you get a in total input of one, which matches the threshold. This one is a negation. It has a threshold of zero. If X is one, what comes in is minus one, it will not fire. But if X is zero, what comes in is zero, and it does match the threshold and it's going to fire. So you can perform all kinds of Boolean operations. What you can't perform is an XR. And this was what Minsky and Papert showed in 1968. Now, you're all familiar with what an XOR function is, right? How many of you don't know what an XOR is? Okay, thank God. Now, uh, so uh, this was in 1968, and when people realized that, you know, this tiny little problem couldn't be solved by a perceptron, the uh, DARPA or whoever was funding Yale for all of this research, the Navy, I think, uh, withdrew their funding and refused to fund Yale for a very long time on this topic. And uh, research on the, uh, on, the, on the problem basically died for a while because people figured that this is not really going to solve the world's problems. But then, somewhere in their work, Minsky and Papert actually made a second claim that people kind of didn't quite uh, understand the importance of. Individual elements of weak computational elements, but if you network them together, they can get fairly powerful, right? So let's look at the uh, XOR again. If I network three of these perceptrons together, I can create an XOR. So now here, I have these inputs. This guy is a simple perceptron which computes X or Y. This one computes not X or not Y. Then I have a final perceptron which combines these two, hands the two, and I get an XOR. Now the thing is, these guys in the middle are what I'm calling the hidden layer. Why are they hidden? Their outputs are not really going to be seen. What you're only seeing is the final output. And uh, if you don't really care what the input hidden values are, you are only interested in the final output. So this is the hidden layer. And using a network of this kind, now you can form a Boolean function. You can form an XOR. But then once you can form an XOR, people realize that you can begin, if you begin connecting these things, you can compose any arbitrary Boolean function. Here's a really ugly function. It's a Boolean function of four variables. And I don't even know what it is. I just made it up on the fly when I was making these slides. What is clear is that I can, I can draw a little new, new uh, uh, you know, network of perceptrons, which computes it. Now again, I've been calling this a network of perceptrons. This is your standard neural network as you know it. This is what we will call a multi-layer perceptron. In that I have taken many perceptrons, connected them up in layers, and I have a final output, and I have a multi-layer perceptron. We'll talk about more, this more in the next class. So. The story so far, neural networks began as computational models of the brain. Their connection is machines. They're also Boolean threshold units. And McAlow and Pitts showed that they are actually Boolean th threshold units, but they didn't give us a learning rule. Uh, Hebb came up with a learning rule that was unstable. Rosenblatt came up with a variant of the McAlow and Pitts neuron for which he actually gave a convergent learning rule. But then he overstated what it could do. Uh, but we discovered later that multilayer perceptrons can model arbitrarily complex Boolean functions. Questions, anybody? So feel free to stop me at any time, okay, if you have questions. All of those things describe Boolean machines. Your brain is not Boolean. Your brain is working on real valued inputs. These are not in you know, a sequence of bits. They're continuous valued inputs, right? We do make Boolean predictions or inferences. You know, is this a clicker or is this not a clicker? That's a binary Boolean answer. But the input that comes in is this entire image. It's me holding this thing and asking you, is this a clicker, right? So the input is very complex and, and real valued. Well, guess what? The perceptron actually works on real valued inputs. If I just restate the same thing to say that X's are real valued, the whole thing still works. I have a weighted combination of inputs, which is compared to a threshold. If it exceeds the threshold, it's going to fire, otherwise not. And I can 
Now, one, once I begin looking at it, like so, when we speak of uh, perceptrons in the modern literature, or uh, the modern, wor modern world, we are not going to simply use a hard threshold. Sometimes we will use a soft threshold. We're going from, instead of going directly from zero to one, you've got to sort of slide from zero to one. This is a, uh, this is a sigmoid, which, which, which is like a smoother version of a uh, threshold, or you can have more generic functions that operate on the weighted combination of, combination of inputs and the threshold. Uh, just to, uh, the only reason I'm mentioning these is that I don't want you to think that I'm going, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to focus entirely on threshold-based units. We're just using threshold units for, uh, to, to provide some intuitions on what is, what is really going on, right? But anyway, let's go back to our threshold unit and look at the kind of function that it actually computes. You're looking at a weighted combination of inputs. If it exceeds the threshold, you to output a one, otherwise it outputs a zero. Now, there is a point, there, is a, there are a set of x's where the threshold is exactly met. And that is the equation of w, trans, w summation wi xi equals t. What's that? That is the equation for a hyperplane. In two dimensions, that would be the equation of a line. So that means it would be something like this line. It says that this criterion condition is exactly met on this line. The output is going to be one on one side and zero on the other side. If I want, if for two dimensional inputs, if I were to plot the function, the function is going to look like this. It's going to be zero right until this line. And then when you cross the line, the output is going to be one. So it's a step function, angled somehow, right? In a generic n dimensional space, on one side of the space, it's going to be zero. And as soon as you cross a hyperplane given by that, by that uh, criterion, the output is going to become a one. And now you can see why this perceptron can be a Boolean function. So in a Boolean uh, world, inputs are going to be either zero or one. If I had only two inputs, input combinations are going to be either zero, zero, one, zero, one, one, or zero, one. And now I can draw a perceptron of that kind over here. And that perceptron is going to output a one for these three combinations and a zero outside. What is this perceptron? What gate is it? Anyone? That's an R, right? If any of the inputs is one, it's, 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 it's a, the output is a one. What about this guy? That's an AND. What about this guy? It's a not Y, right? It's inverting Y and ignoring X. So you can see how just having this simple linear uh, threshold function can perform uh, Boolean arithmetic. And it also tells you that you can come design an infinity of different perceptrons, all of which would be an R or an AND for any given Boolean operation. The number of possibilities of, you know, perceptron rules, you don't need just weights of one, the specific examples I showed you, there are other things that would also work. But then once you design this, kind of, once you realize what's going on, you can build arbitrarily complex functions. So look at this guy. I want a function that's working on two dimensional input, but the output is zero if the input is inside the pentagon and zero outside. I'm allowed to use perceptrons to compose this function. Uh, com com to compose a function that has this output. How would I do it? Anybody? Speak up. Thank you. So I can have one perceptron which does this, another one which does that, a third which does that, a fourth which does that, a fifth which does that, and a sixth which ends the outputs, right? And voila. I have a network which actually produces this, uh, exactly this kind of uh, output, right? But this should tell you more. Now I can do something like this. And how would I do it? It's on the slide, so you, know, you don't have to actually exercise your imagination. I have one subnetwork which computes one, one, the other one computes the other polygon, polygon, or the two. And now I have a somewhat more complex decision boundary. How would I build these guys? Anyone? How can I compose a network which com has these totally ridiculous looking decision boundaries? Somebody speak up, Venkat. Mm -hmm. That's no, so I want a more specific answer. Yes. Exactly. I can just break these, decompose these figures into many complex, many convex little, uh, a, a union of convex shapes. 
I can have one subnetwork for every convex subcomponent and, and then R the lot. And then I have this, right? I can, I can build this guy. So uh, we can build arbitrarily complex shapes. So when I'm performing classification, what am I really doing? If I have to look at something like this and say is this a two or not, that's a 764 dimensional input. In 764 dimensional space, I can assume that all the twos lie within some region and everything that's not two lies outside the region. And all I really have to do is to build a function that learns to model this guy, right? So continuing our story, we've seen that MLPs, multi-layer perceptrons, are connectionist computational models. They can model Boolean functions, but they're actually Boolean machines. They represent Boolean functions over linear boundaries, and they can represent arbitrary decision boundaries. They can be used to classify data. But you can do more. You can model real valued functions. So let's say you have continuous valued output, something like this, where again, I'm working on two dimensional input in this case, and I want an output which is not just zero or one, but continuous valued. Can I do this? And we will see more of how I can do this for any kind of function in the next class. But I'll give you a heads up on how this would actually happen. So let's look at functions of a single variable. I want an arbitrarily complex, arbitrary function of a single variable. Before I do that, I'm going to start by building a simple component, which is this little network, which takes two inputs, which takes a single input. The input is fed to two perceptrons. The first perceptron fires if the input exceeds thre uh, thre threshold T1. The second one, second one fires if it exceeds T2. And then their outputs are combined with weights one and minus one respectively. So what happens? As the input scans left to right, when it first exceeds T1, the first one is going to fire, the second one will not. So the output goes to one. But then when I exceed T2, the second one also fires and cancels out the first guy. And the output goes back to zero. So between T1 and T2, I can have an output of one. Elsewhere, I can have an output of zero. And now I can model any function. Right? I can have, I can decompose this function, approximate it as a sequence, you know, as a sequence of step functions. And for, I can have one pair for each of these guys. This figure is wrong, but uh, uh, actually not really. So I can have one pair of each of these guys. And each pair is going to be scaled by the height of the function within that region. So as I go left to right, I'm always going to get some an output which kind of approximates the function that I really want. I can make the approximation arbitrarily precise by making these narrower and having more and more neurons. So what we really see is that uh, in addition to being connectionist computational models that can perform classification, MLPs also model continuous valued functions. Now through these slides, I'm going to keep retaining this uh, pattern of summarizing everything that we've done so far using the story so far. So questions, if you have any questions, these are the slides where I'm going to pause and here's where you ask questions. Right. Questions? Yeah. Are neural networks, everything I'm talking about in this course is a neural network, yes. So there's one instance of neural networks, yeah. In fact, we're going to build everything on top of multi-layer perceptrons. The basic definition of a neural network in the first place was what we call a multi-layer perceptron. Yes. Yes, you certainly can, yeah, and so, so, so the point is, we are looking at the simplest possible units. The more complex you make the units, the, you know, the harder it is to get any kind of interpretation of how these things behave. Uh, our entire focus is on building up these architectures of trivially simple units. And why, the, why are these things so immensely popular and powerful? If you focus on an individual unit, the individual units are amazingly simple. All they are doing is looking at a weighted combination of inputs, and they're putting it through a nonlinear function, which can actually be a threshold. If all I do is to just look at the weighted combination of inputs and apply a threshold to it, I can model any function in the universe. That's what we've seen. So the simplicity of it is really powerful. Anyway, so here are all the other things 
MLPs can do. They can model memory. So for everything that we've seen, is kind of feed forward. Input comes in, gets processed, then that gets processed, gets processed, and then gets spat out. Becomes an output. Uh, but uh, you can actually have loopy networks where the output of a computation can go back eventually after some further processing to the same unit. And Lawrence in 1930 proposed this as a model for how memory is stored in the, in the, in the central nervous system. Now we will, in many, many moons from now, uh, at least two moons, right? Uh, two, four months from now, four months, three, four months from now. We're actually going to look at these guys. How I can use the same simple architecture and compose really fancy models of memory. And one of the things you'll, you'll note about how your memory operates is that you don't just carry everything out iconically in your head. You get reminded of stuff from partial and par partial observation. You know, nothing more, uh, uh, you know, evocative, for instance, than a smell. You're going somewhere, you smell something, you remember something completely irrelevant from your childhood because you've made an association between that smell and whatever it is you remember, right? How does that happen? So it turns out that that's memory, and those things can be explained by loopy networks. Uh, you can compute neural networks in addition to the kinds of functions that we saw. They can compute probability distributions over all kinds of domains, including complex value domains. They can compute, uh, they can represent distributions of data. They can also represent a posterior, compute a posteriori probability, meaning I have some belief about the, of the world, then I see some data, I change my belief, and something else comes out. All of that can be modeled by, uh, um, by uh, neural networks, MLPs. So, yes, that was Ramesh who asked. Then, what was the team? No, someone asked, okay. Uh, it doesn't matter. No. <laughs> and here, here's something else they can do, I think. <laughs> but anyway, that's just me being facetious. So, when I'm speaking of neural networks in AI, the network is just a function. Given an input, it computes the function layer-wise to predict the output. And so what are all of these boxes? These boxes are just neural, neural networks. In all of these tasks that we just saw, the little structures that I, we, I just showed you, those are the structures that actually go into these boxes. And it's phenomenal how something so simple, which just consists of some really trivially simple processing elements connected in a network and can perform amazing tasks like uh, recognize speech as well as human beings or caption text, or play chess, or beat the, learn to beat the world champion at Go. Right? So in closing, interesting AI tasks are functions that can be modeled by neural networks. So that's the final slide. Uh, now, in the next lecture, which is going to be on Friday, so this is the only week where we have a class on Friday, and that's because I came in late from India, so we swapped the recitation and the class, and the recitation happened on Monday, and this class, and the, and the second class is going to be on Friday. So uh, we are going to cover uh, more on how neural networks are universal approximators, why we believe they can model pretty much any function in the universe. And uh, we've been speaking of deep neural networks. What is this business of depth, and why do we care? And how should we think about it? We will also look at that problem. So I'll, the next class, Friday is in Posner Hall, 151, right? Where recitations are supposed to be held. Yeah. All right. So nobody wants to have questions, ask questions, because everybody's in a hurry to leave. Yes?